Today we have two amazing guests, Priscilla Adams, Group Compliance Director of Bullish, and David Carlyle, author of Crypto Launderers and VP of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at Elliptic. Hello, guys. How are we doing today? Oh, good. Very excited to be here. So thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Doing very well. Thanks. Thanks, Gil. Awesome. Yeah, doing great. All right. So uh, first things first, guys. Uh, last week, we were discussing Bitcoin ETF and, you know, the upcoming uh, bull market, hopefully. So what are your feelings for today's uh, market conditions? How do you feel about Bitcoin and Ethereum is about to hit 3K? What are your thoughts about it? Where we said at um, Elliptic, um, where I work, we're working on kind of the, the regulatory compliance side. It's it's a very interesting time because I think um, kind of following the crypto winter and bear market, as it were, um, there's a sense that uh, I think definitely more positive sen sentiment um, coming online we're also starting to see um, new regulatory frameworks come online around the world and we're you know as, as i think was indicated by the you know the approval of bitcoin etf in the states um kind of renewed interest from players in particular and in getting back to the space as the market picks up and well, yeah certainly on our end uh, a lot of uh, interest and excitement as well awesome so it feels to me like uh, today's topic of our twitter space which is balancing decentralization and regulation and uh, future of financial crime is the perfect one for today's conversation because we see more and more people coming for us being crypto natives already it's time to think about how we're going to manage it uh, you know how we're going to guide all these people who are about to enter this space uh, you know within all these you know complicated rather complicated uh, crypto structures. So um, I have a question. This one, Priscilla, is for you. So uh, in your role as Group Compliance Director of Bullish, uh, how do you envision a regulatory framework that supports the decentralized nature of Web3 while ensuring robust compliance? I, so I think the first thing that we have to recognize is that every regulator is going to want to create a framework based off of what works for their particular market. and. We see also um, some baseline principles coming out from global bodies like IOSCO, FATF, etc. I think if a regulator has agreed to permit the use of, of, um, of, of crypto uh, in their given market, it's time to kind of move beyond thinking about all of this as like, this dichotomy between Web3 and regulation where it's like opponents in a boxing ring. I like to think about it a lot more as it's a type of negotiation where the regulator has said, we want DeFi to play because we see the benefit of it in our market. Then there's going to be room to work around the edges to make that happen. But of course, with every negotiation, it means that each side is going to have to compromise on something. And that's where we get into. So how is regulation going to work in these complex situations? And I'd say on the one on the one hand, when I think about from a DeFi perspective, uh, what is it that you're probably going to need to address as some of those stumbling blocks or uh, pain points uh, is firstly, if you're touching financial products and financial services, then you have to rec recognize that you're going to have to play by the rules of the game. I think that's starting to be increasingly recognized. Um, the other piece is that anonymity isn't going to work in a regulated financial system, but there is space for privacy, right? And those concepts I do see as being slightly different. From the regulatory perspective, in order to make the market attractive and to really make the most of that opportunity, and also bearing in mind that regulators are always looking at you know, how do we provide market stability? How do we make sure that uh, consumers and investors are protected to so the integrity of the market? That's the lens that they're coming from. I'd say, though, at the same time that um, you have to be careful not to reintroduce inefficiencies into the market that all of the DeFi world was out to break at the outset. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. So I, I think I'm not giving like, a real, um, this is how to do it. There's not going to be one set answer for everyone, but I think there are um, kind of guide rails or there's definitely enough space to play to get that, um, that, that relationship going between the regulators, what they want to achieve, and then what the world of Web3 wants to achieve. But there's going to be some compromise in the middle. 
Yeah, definitely. Cannot disagree with that because uh, still, you know, the de uh, decentralized Web3 world wants to keep this decentralization going and regulators obviously see, you know, the dangers that uh, Web3 might bring. So, David, based on your insights and crypto launderers, how do you think decentralized platforms uh, can be regulated without compromising their core principles? You know, it's important to understand, I think, firstly, that uh, like decentralization isn't a binary concept you know it's not necessarily the case that you're either um, decentralized or you're not um, i think there's a spectrum of decentralization and centralization and different protocols and projects can fall along different places on that spectrum at any given time i mean you might even have a particular platform or project that um, may move along the spectrum more or less decentralized over time it's, it's not a static thing and i think um one thing that regulators and policymaking bodies like the, the Financial Action Task Force have made very clear is that just because you call yourself decentralized, that doesn't mean you can't, um, you're not regulatable. I mean, if regulators find points, supposedly decentralized arrangement, where there are individuals or groups of individuals who seem to be exercising influence or control over things or who may be operating in some profit making capacity, then regulators may try and enforce rules of people in those arrangements. And, and that's already been true to an to extent in the U.S. especially, where regulators have begun taking actions against the founders and in some cases DAOs associated with DeFi arrangement, arrangements, arguing that, you know, despite their claims to be decentralized, these platforms are often profit-making ventures that are just being regulated financial services of the public with a different face. So I think the first thing to realize involved in any sort of, you know, since we decentralized project is that regulators may take a look at what you're doing and decide you should be already complying with regulation, whether you like it or not. Um, I think, though, I, I would definitely what Priscilla said there, and I think um, it, it, we shouldn't really look at only black and white issue of kind of um, decentralization against regulation, because I think there are a couple of areas where those involved in, in DeFi or other decentralized projects within the Web3 space should see room for I think some common ground with regulatory objectives. So I think one of these relates to things like protecting your platform against things like hacks. Um, you know, it's really not in the interest of establishing a DeFi or other decentralized projects to have it hacked by North Korean criminals, uh, which we've seen happen plenty of times. You know, that totally undermines what you're trying to do. It's not going to give you a good reputation. People are going to want to work with you. Um, and I think, you know, regulators in North Korea are earning money by hacking these protocols. So, you know, it makes total sense for those in building decentralized platforms to do things like undergo meaningful audits that ensure their platform is safe and secure. And in fact, we are starting to see more and more instances of that with folks in the DeFi space doing things like seeking out audits to reinforce the security of their protocols. Um, I think another point relates to things like dis detecting suspicious or illegal transactions. Um, I mean, increasingly analytic, we are um, seeing De DeFi platforms and innovators and, and working with them who are looking to use solutions like blockchain analytics as ways to identify whether their platforms are being used for activities like money laundering. And um, if they do identify it, share this information with law enforcement. And again, I, I think this makes total sense. If, if your platform is being used by North Korea to launder lots of crypto, that's just not good for your long-term future. It's not the type of attention that you want. And so, you know, I think there's some already some areas where we're seeing regulators start to set expectations around accountability as a point where I think those involved with decentralized projects and DeFi um, should engage with those efforts and can without without compromising too much of what they're setting out to do. Um, I, I, Priscilla alluded to this, but I think a much more complicated and controversial is around the prospect of um, KYC, so know your customer provisions and identity, identity verification in the de decentralized space. I think, you know, the notion of having KD and DeFi does but contrary to what a lot of folks have been trying to accomplish there. And as Brazil was mentioning, I think regulators really just don't have any tolerance for the notion of complete anonymity. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's a specific and, and quite complex problem. And maybe we'll get into ways to potentially address that. But I do think on securing on certain fronts, like securing your platform against hacks, identifying illicit transactions, there are already ways to try and address that, which needn't really try, like, totally compromise what innovators in the space are trying to do if, if it's applied in a, you know, a really thoughtful and proportionate way. 
Yeah, I, I'd just say I agree with what you've uh, a lot of what you've uh, said, David, and what you say about it being a spectrum is really, really critical. Like, if I were to take a moment and think about, you know, is there a decentralized platform out there at the moment that's really doing like uh, doing what you would want a regulated entity to to do? I struggle to find one in terms of that spectrum of pure DeFi, pure decentralized. Um, uh, protocol. That being said, and, the, and, and what I what I have seen just also from where I sit within bullish is, you know, as we're doing uh, any type of investigation, you can you can identify and see, hey, here is uh, this you know, using tools such as Elliptic or or other. Um, you can see if there's money flowing through a completely decentralized um, exchange, say CowSwap, right? Then there's zero KYC being done. And as a regulated entity, then that's a problem, right? Because you KYC your clients, but if you're looking at clients who are choosing to use exchanges um, that have no KYC whatsoever, then that's a risk for you, right? And I mean, who knows if that client actually understands the risk that they're running as well around whether or not their assets are truly safeguarded. I think there are some interesting cases coming up, though, where you get a touch of regulation or you get some players, especially in um, RWAs and RWAs and the crypto space and Web3 sense of real world assets, as opposed to the TradFi uh, sense of risk weighted assets. Uh, but when we start talking about some of these um, new RWA uh, services uh, and protocols coming out, a lot of the firms do see themselves as software providers. So okay. the models of this get to be quite interesting in terms of how they're managing. Right. So if you take, um, uh, say, like a Maple Finance or a Centrifuge um, or any of the others, they're not typically regulated. However, they will require the customers to be KYC'd. And when you look at who they're using to kind of custody some of these assets, these are all, all the custodians are regulated entities. So you get a bit of this like mix and match coming through from, all right, if I'm a DeFi protocol, I can do my KYC uh, on my customers so that I can verify that I know who they are. And I'm probably being held to a standard by these custodians um, because they're not going to custody my assets or my client's assets if I'm not performing KYC in the first place. Um, I'd say whether or not this will stand the test of time is uh, the jury's really out on that. Because if we take and just draw a parallel to TradFi, you can't typically rely on the controls of your third party. At the moment, it's permissible, but I don't know personally uh, what's driving that that activity being permissible. If it's that it's a loophole in terms of re uh, the regulators are focused on other more material risks at this point or getting the initial regulation in place, or if it's one of those things where the regulation won't come until something blows up, um, or if it's the regulators saying, we're going to let this play out and see what happens. So there's a lot of kind of wait and see, but we are, uh, I think there is potential for these points of tension to be worked through in some more creative ways than what we've seen in, say, a pure TradFi model historically. I had a question about, um, if we're looking at the asset themselves, how the USS approach has been, like thinking, is Bitcoin a security or not, or is Ethereum now the reconsidering that that's a security? Do you believe that if there's a digital asset that is maybe, if it is linked to a financial system, or if it's not, they're actually regulated differently or treated differently, um, meaning that, uh, the, you know, for these altcoins, there's a lot of altcoins that whether or not you really need to regulate them, I don't know. What are your thoughts on the on that? Well, I, I'd say on on that point, uh, we already see in quite a lot of different regulations issued by di by different jurisdictions. They the, the definition of what is regulated is usually quite specific, right? So you usually have these carve outs around CBDCs are going to be treated one way. You have utility tokens, NFTs, um, or <laughs> most NFTs uh, to date being treated another way, and then you have everything in between. And I think it's going to be one of those areas, but maybe David will have a view on this as well, where there's what really becomes the litmus test is slightly unclear with some of these outcomes.
coins, right? Is it because they're simply being traded? Does that mean that they are behaving um, like a security? Or if there's really, if if they're not being used in that way, if they are almost rewards um, or different or different things, does that mean that they go down the route of, you know, they're not really a financial instrument, so therefore we don't need to uh, consider them? And, my, and we might not necessarily see uniform decisions across jurisdictions. You know, I think there'll be cases where we might not even see uniform decisions within specific jurisdictions. I mean, especially if you look at, like, the U.S., for example, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the, the industry was, I think just to a large extent, rightly um, very satisfied with the uh, outcomes of the, the Ripple decision that happened last year and the, the decision of that particular judge to determine that, um, at least in most circumstances, uh, XRP wasn't a security. Um, but we made very other judges in the U.S. look at other um, uh, assets that have been launched and attributed under similar conditions and come to different decisions based upon uh, the facts and circumstances of each case. And so um, I actually think it's it's not something where we're likely to see um, very clear-cut decision-making uh, in, in the large majority of instances, but where it's going to be kind of an evolving uh, standard or evolving uh, outcomes. Um, uh, David, from your experience at Elliptic, uh, how do you think, what are the major challenges in tracking financial crimes within decentralized platforms? I alluded uh, briefly a moment ago, but, um, you know, there are suspects in which tracking financial crime within DeFi and, and the broader Web3 decentralized space more generally um, is actually easier than in other components of the crypto ecosystem. So, um, you know, with, I guess, if it's not a like DeFi with the, the Web3 space, um, you know, everything is recorded on um, all transactions, all swap, um, loans, what you're talking about. Um, all that information is is executed by smart contracts that are operating on the blockchain. And we have a very complete record of the transactions that are taking place there. And this contrasts to kind of the CFI elements of the crypto space. Um, you know, when funds are moving through the blockchain and then they're sent into a centralized exchange service, the ability to keep tracing is actually broken. Um, the large exchanges and other services really act like mixers, so they break the trail of traceability. Um, in DeFi, however, everything is being recorded on smart contracts on the blockchain, and there isn't this sort of off-chain accounting you get in the CeFi space. Um, we can effectively just think. So where we've seen actors like, say, Korean cyber criminals trying to launder funds through the DeFi space, and they're, say, swapping funds through X and then um, exchanging them on some lending protocol and then moving them through bridges and other types of um, components of the ecosystem, we can actually just keep going. And um, the data science behind that is fairly sophisticated um, in terms of what it requires, but in terms of the uh, sort of software capabilities that companies like Elliptic develop now, um, we can effectively do sort of instantaneous real-time tracing of that activity. So, you know, within DeFi, you do have this um, this uh, component of transparency because of the, the amount of activity that is recorded on chain. Um, I do think the biggest challenge, we've, we've talked about this already, is the issue around the lack of KYC in a lot of components in the space. Um, you know, you can trace funds through the DeFi system, but you might not always have complete records in terms of uh, who is undertaking those transactions. Um, typically, what we tend to see, though, is criminals still, by and large, require the ability to cash and convert their funds from crypto into fiat. So at some stage in the laundering process, even if they've moved funds through say, numerous DeFi protocols during the money laundering process, they will try to take those funds to a centralized entity to cash them out into fiat currencies that they can use in a more practical context. And that's where they do tend to become um, more vulnerable. Um, Criminals use to try and evade detection in DeFi as a money laundering technique we describe as chain hopping. Um, we especially see, you know, some sophisticated uh, actors like North Korea do this, where they will say um, obtain funds through a hack that are in uh, a stable coin. They'll then swap it at a dex using these fairly sophisticated techniques to try to um, swap funds, different assets across the DeFi ecosystem, and a technique that's known as as chain hopping. Um, but even this is something that we can have with advanced blockchain analytics. And um, this does require that we're going to have tools and training to be able to undertake investigation into what's, you know, fairly sophisticated money laundering activity in a relative sense in the crypto space. Um, but the capability to detect illicit DeFi and, and, de de or illicit and, and the Web3 space is, is certainly there already and, and already being utilized.
All right, then, David, uh, can you give us an example of how criminals have adapted to the rise of Web3 technologies uh, based on your research? You mentioned that now, you know, um, use some, how should I call it correctly, like not traditional, non-standard approaches, you know, to these um, digital crimes. So um, maybe you have, uh, you know, certain examples of the way the uh, criminals adapted to the rise of Web3 technologies in particular. We're definitely seeing criminals operate in the Web3 space. Um, you know, we are starting to see um, examples of financial crime be, being committed in corners of the metaverse, for example. Um, I mean, to some extent, I, the crime itself is actually anything really new. Um, it's sort of forms in crime we've seen in, in other components of the crypto space or even in broader components of the financial sector. You know, we see things like scams, thoughts, hacking. Of things we've seen before, I think we'll start to see, and I think there have been some cases of things like um, ransomware and other types of crime, um, the emergence of maybe even dark web market in parts of the metaverse. Um, as case, I think we're just going to see a migration of certain types of crime we already encounter moving to some of these new environments. So I think it's more the case that the, um, the crime will mostly be the same of what's being, the crime, types of crime that are being committed, but I think what's novel and different is the nature of the space in which we're seeing this all happen. Um, you know, and there are a number of challenges to say enforce the law. You know, how do you determine which law enforcement agencies or regulators have jurisdiction in a particular part of the metaverse? Um, who gets to decide that? Um, how is that determined? There are certain just tech challenges that say enforcement agency will face when it comes to um, trying to train law enforcement agents to be able to detect crime in the metaverse. Um, so again, I, I think it's less the case that is necessarily new. Um, it may be certain new types. Of, you know, again, as I mentioned, we see a lot of, increasingly a lot of state actors like North Korea operating in the space um, who are able to operate in some relatively sophisticated ways. But I, th I think these bigger issues challenges are, are more around um, this question of, of how do you, you apply the law in the space? How do you train law enforcement agents so they can um, track someone down in the metaverse and determine how that's happening and then, you know, bring legal cases uh, involving crimes that are happening in this kind of uh, virtual space? So I, I think those are really the kind of biggest issues we're seeing around how this is starting to emerge and evolve. Hey, Priscilla, did you have a perspective on, on this question? Um, I, I think with I, I think I echo what David has said in many ways. I think one of the interesting points, though, to bear in mind is in some ways it's not too dissimilar from what we've seen in traditional financial markets. Right. So as um, you're going back to when all of the a lot of the big AML crackdowns uh, were happening, you know, starting beginning of circa um, 2012 ish, then what we saw happen is you do get strength and controls and the regulated financial institutions that pushes criminals to the periphery or forces them to innovate in terms of how they are acting. As we see um, and you know, the pace of regulation that we've seen around virtual assets, especially if you track it since like F the uh, FTX collapse, um, it's so much faster than anything that we saw in TradFi. I mean, I, I love to use the example of like MIFID 2 because if you really track start to finish, it's about 30 years from the first scandal <laughs> to when it's like fully implemented. So everything is really compressed. And this is also forcing uh, you know, more of this, what I'll term the C5 players to regu get regulated faster. Uh, and I think that will then narrow the opportunity that money launderers have in terms of the spaces in which they can operate. It's not to say that it's going to be impossible, but as you have these controls being implemented, they are going to have to become more creative. And the main concern, which David rightly pointed out, are those on and off ramps, right? So when the, la the launderer is putting the cash onto a platform or converting it, or, or if it's you know, coming from ransomware or a hack and it's already in virtual assets is then when they go to cash out, your on and off ramps are really the most critical um, moments of truth um, uh, with it. And thanks for sharing that. I guess um, when we look at uh, these, and the regulators are moving faster. I mean, I was in a space um, after the last crypto winter, I moved into a license exchange and we were focused on uh, security token offerings. And at that point in time, I learned 
quite a lot about, you know, how things work uh, in a TradFi market. But it, as we know, technology continues to change. And I was just interviewing this uh, one guy, um, Dr. Duncan Wong. He's one of the speakers at the Well Summit this year. Um, he focuses on quantum computing. I was at quantum resistant uh, computing. And then his, he what he was saying is today, or actually maybe in a few years, it would be very easy to identify um, who owns a wallet and you know where where things are going in and out um, and then he was saying from, from a scary point of view or from a technology point of view that quantum computing is going to really change that and make it a little bit stronger on the security side but with uh, AI coming into place he also mentioned that a lot of AI is being used um, in many different ways, mainly to improve productivity and, and create some efficiencies. So he's been using AI to help audit some of this code because I was asking them, um, you know, what his process were for auditing code and, you know, going through, there's a, n only a number of players out there that are starting to look at ensuring, I guess, uh, their audits and, and so on and so forth. But what do, you, what do either of you, both uh, Elliptic and Bullish, are you looking at artificial, artificial intelligence in a in a meaningful way to kind of support what the business is trying to do? Uh, I'll, I'll kick on. Yes, we are. So at, at Bullish, uh, we do have a dedicated um, team of engineers who are looking at how to integrate AI um, into the business. Um, if I park it from the support and driving the business and look at it strictly from a compliance perspective, I'd say I'm quite excited about the opportunities that AI presents, um, with the exception of the uh, the opportunities for fraud, which it also presents. And I, I think that there's been you know, a couple of cases that were in the news recently uh, where you had you know passport um, faked using AI and their path. Um, some of the KYC providers um, on some platforms, right? So I think um, firms will have to strengthen their KYC controls and respond. If we if we then move from, okay, well, what's the criminal aspect how and how it's used by criminals in terms of applying it from a compliance perspective, whether it's, you know, spending a lot of time when you're drafting a license application, writing policies, there's an application of AI for you, right? There's a, there's, um, if you look at also from a KYC perspective and onboarding, you can apply AI as well. But I think kind of the biggest value add is probably going to sit in more the investigation side, because when you do traditional investigations work, and my husband uh, used to work in investigations at a traditional bank, and I'll leave him, his identity um, uh, anonymous in this case. Um, I remember he had to get this massive laptop um, that would be able to manage the data of really doing the analysis of analyzing all the different data points that were being used by prof professional money laundering networks. Um, and it's very time consuming. And then when you think of the application of AI, the fact that you know we have this enhanced traceability, we are building networks of activity that um, AI should be able to make some of those connections for us and be an added layer to really um, enable an analyst or investigator, whether they're coming from public or private sector, Sector, law enforcement to get to the information faster and hopefully identify these uh, these these networks and these more sophisticated criminals um, at a pace that we haven't been able to do. Either. Yeah, I can take. We're we're looking at um, the question of AI from as Gisela mentioned, both from the latest um, point of AML and, and money laundering detection um, and. Um, and improving compliance responses, but also trying to understand how criminals might evolve and leverage the, sort of the new technologies. So, I mean, the former part around oh, uh, AI can and machine learning compliance, um, but we're already starting to do quite a elliptic looking at questions around how, say, machine learning could be used to um, enable the smarter and more effective detection of patterns of money laundering on the blockchain. So. And just with the block, just tremendous wealth of transaction data. I mean, you might even say the, the most um, the, the most vast and open um, set of transaction data that's ever existed um, in the world. And um, we are starting to do um, some pretty interesting um, work looking at in how you can apply machine learning to harness that data, um, identify patterns of money laundering, potentially. Um, enable the detection of money laundering with a level of accuracy that has maybe not even been possible in, in more traditional components of the financial sector, because we do have this very open um, 
data set that we can work with that isn't kind of characterized by the level of say fragmentation you get in the traditional financial sector where um, each financial institution will have its own data set and will know about its own customers and their transactions, but they can't see the entire um, ecosystem, which we are able to see in crypto because of the transparency of the blockchain. And so I think there's a lot of exciting work uh, already being done there. And I think over the next several years, I, I'm quite hopeful we'll see some really meaningful progress in terms of the ability to apply like advanced machine learning techniques to, to money laundering detection in crypto. Um, but we are very alert to uh, the question of you know how illicit and criminals can use AI potentially and fuse it with crypto um, in in committing crimes. So, um, we are starting to see things like um, criminals and, and frauds uh, creating deep fakes to scam people and getting them to send them crypto as part of those scams. Um, you know, there's some indication that hackers may be looking now to uh, deploying similar methods using AI to make their scams more realistic and more effective and more scalable. Uh, we're starting to do things like uh, see criminals uh, use LLMs to uh, scam messages that they can send to people and, and scale their own operations. And a lot of these are starting to, uh, we're starting to see these being fused now with some of the crypto scams and, and frauds we see out there. So um, that's very something we're very alert to as well and, and are paying a lot of attention to. Um, again, you know, I think it's not just like the case that the, the, the crimes themselves will change, but I think it just um, it, it isn't. Another level of adaptation that will involve, you know, and require different types of responses from from the public and private sectors, uh, you know, where they're trying to stop these things. Well, where, where can actually people find out about these scams? So there's, I've read some of those deep fake stories, and you always wonder, is that, um, you know, some some rumor, like someone's like building these stories? But you know, how yeah. do you find out about all these different scams? And I, there's got to be a lot of education that needs to happen in this space. And we have teams of analysts who are kind of scouring the web um, for these scams all the time. Uh, we we actually do on the AI AI front uh, have some. Uh, research we're going to be publishing fairly soon. If, if folks check out the Lipdick blog over the coming uh, couple of weeks, I think we should have a few interesting case studies that uh, people will find quite informative. Great. I'll, I'll check that out. Gio? Yeah, I'm going to check that out too. Definitely. And uh, at this moment, I would like to thank you guys for your answers because, you know, for every question we raise, uh, you give us such a detailed, you know, thoughts, such detailed thoughts uh, on them. So it's a real pleasure to me, you know, to have this conversation now. And the topic is crucially important now because, you know, the feeling of the upcoming bull run is getting me more and more with every day. You know, and I just feel like it might happen even tomorrow, maybe within a week. And yeah, we need to be prepared. Definitely. We need to be prepared with all this regulatory you know, systems that would help us you know to continue building and uh, at this moment priscilla i have a question for you so uh, coming from a background in traditional finance as we see greater uh, interconnectedness between tradfi cfi defi uh, how can these different models find a way to work together uh, and what industries would benefit the most from the next few years and your thoughts um so i think coming from so in, in terms of where it's going in the future, I, I think we are, you know, we, we've seen quite a lot happen recently. If I, if I take a step back um, and say with TradFi and going back a little bit to what David had talked about as, as well with the capabilities that we have, there's been this kind of, on the one, there's been these two camps. For this one camp that has said, well, um, uh, because we have things like blockchain analytics, things are more transparent on the blockchain. That's the nature of it. And that should help try traditional financial institutions get a bit more comfortable in getting involved with, um, with DeFi and with Web3. Um, on the other hand, I think there are some very valid points that this has to be balanced against the fact that while we do have greater transparency, sometimes we identify who these actors are after the case, right? So if we look at the world today, and if you're doing like an, a piece of, an, uh, of analysis or investigation, then you see, if you take sanctions as an example, a lot of the sanctions designations, a lot of the mixer designations, these are things that happen 
after the money has moved or after the mixers have been in place for a long time and then a regulator comes in and designates them, then the tools pick them up, they identify them, and it's easy to identify the bad actors. But you're still a little bit on the back foot. So there's, I think there eventually we will get to a point where it is better. Absolutely. I, I think that on the education front, the education needs to go in a lot, a, a number of different directions, right? So I think that TradFi can actually learn quite a bit from DeFi. And I think that DeFi has already been forced to learn from TradFi quite quickly um, as these regulations have come out. From a TradFi perspective, I mean, just as David had mentioned, like with law enforcement agencies needing to learn um, how to use these sophisticated tools, I'd say that as we see other TradFi institutions, and if you take like, Sokjin as an example, um, and Forge and how they're uh, regulated um, uh, it, it, by the by the French regulator. Um, you'd say, well, of course, they're going to uh, uh, have uh, the knowledge and expertise to look at the financial crimes, etc. But I'd say a lot of traditional banks today probably have exposure to to virtual assets even if they're not directly playing in the virtual asset space itself. And that's where understanding what the where these on and off ramps are, where these flows, where these monetary flows are likely to look like, what some of the new typologies are. I don't think that if you're traditional banking, if you're a traditional financial institution today, that, that you can say, well, only um, we, you know, we only do payroll for a crypto company, therefore that's um, all the exposure that we have. I, I think that's a little bit naive, right? So I think there is also a need for TradFi to, even if it's not part of their appetite, to long-term really bank um, a lot of virtual asset uh, providers, especially in some jurisdictions, less likely uh, than in others. There's, that's no excuse for lacking the knowledge of how to identify how these crimes are evolving and what the tools are that you should, that you should have in your toolkit and how you should be upskilling um, no matter what. And I think it's going to be a really fascinating period as we see this interconnectedness, right? So I, I, I think with the um, ETFs um, that have happened, that's a, the that's a first kind of break point as we see like a lot of the stable coin uh, regulations coming in and stable coin um, being used quite a lot. That's going to be another touch point for interconnectivity between the two. And well, of course, RWAs. Right. And if and if you think if you and you take like RWAs and you just think um, last year because um, treasuries were getting a bigger yield than a lot of um, DeFi projects, you have, I think, today over 840 million of tokenized uh, U.S. treasuries because of the five, basically 4.9% uh, yield that you're getting on them. And so you know, that's a lot of money. That had that is in the financial system that is related to virtual assets, and this is only going to increase um, uh, in in the next twelve to twenty four months, and hopefully support a bull run, uh, as Gio was mentioned. Bull run, we'll see if it's coming. But I guess uh, to to your uh, point around interconnectedness uh, within jurisdictions, uh, Priscilla, do you? I mean, generally, every single jurisdiction is going to look at digital assets differently, but in the sense of stable coins and how kind of uh, FX works today or how fiat money is actually accepted in many different countries, there seems to be some established uh, ground rules uh, on how they're managed. So what do you think, and uh, this is both for you and, um, and, and David, what would need to be in place to allow global cooperation in this space when it comes to um, you know, the evolving uh, digital assets and stable coins. David? Or yeah, do you Priscilla? want to think of first? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, you know, answered very, pretty significantly in terms of which jurisdictions you're talking about and where they are in the journey to mm -hmm. regulate the technology. I mean, you know, there are a number of jurisdictions that have really not moved yet on crypto asset regulations or are still in the formative stages or e of even trying to regulate the space. I, I think they're still very early in that you're talking about the need to do some fairly basic bread and butter things, just even articulating basic rules about who will be covered by regulation. So, you know, I, I think there, there are jurisdictions that are still moving slowly. Um, and, and, you know, that is one of the biggest vulnerabilities when it comes to the problem of, of financial crime, which we've been talking about. Um, you know, you still have this problem that in many cases, um, criminals can access and cash out funds at exchange services and jurisdictions that just don't uh, regulate crypto at all. And it's basic fundamental 
issues just need to be addressed. You know, I think if you look at other um, jurisdictions like, you know, US, um, the EU, Hong Kong, or any others, you know, major financial centers much further along with scale uh, or the journey in terms of imposing regulation. I mean, I think each, um, you know, each jurisdiction has its own kind of nuances and issues that they're working through. I think, you know, part of what, to what we've been talking about today, though, I, I would, when it comes to some of the more novel innovations of the technology like DeFi, Web3, I'd really like to see regulators and policymakers start thinking outside the box about, um, you know, how can we do things uh, a little bit differently here that isn't just, uh, you know, a cut and paste from the way things have always been done. And, um, you know, are there ways with technology itself to uh, help us navigate and surmount the challenges that we're talking about? And I think there is some really interesting thinking starting to go on uh, on that point from a number of quarters. Um, a former colleague of mine, I, I used to work at Treasury, uh, Michael Moser, who, who is a colleague of mine of one of the U.S. agencies for a time in the U.S., um, he just put out a, an interesting paint of other folks in the space looking at how regulatory regimes could be adapted to more of a decentralized Web3 type environment that might involve some, um, you know, kind of novel application, how a regulation is applied to certain types of actors in the ecosystem, but it's more than just saying, you know, okay, we're going to take the old banking regulation, pose it on anyone, everyone. Uh, the, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC, uh, recently put out a report on DeFi where they're uh, indicating they're starting to look at some of these questions around, you know, what works from the existing world of finance that we can apply to this space versus what might be need, might need to evolve to, to new types of business models we're seeing in this space. So, um, you know, I'm thinking going on, I do think it's going to take time to get there. Um, but, but, you know, I do think one thing that really features consideration of how things like the transparency of the blockchain can be leveraged as a mitigating feature in dealing with challenges like crime or market manipulation or rubbing conduct and some of the other, you know, concerns that regulators have. Um, you know, for example, and I know, um, you know, the Bank of International Settlements, uh, the policy soft have been starting to think of types of questions, but the transparency of the blockchain potentially lends itself to, you know, open real-time data reporting and uh, data analysis um, that can allow regulators to detect and identify risks in ways that are potentially quite interesting, very novel. And so, um, you know, I, I think all things should be on the table. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's never going to be a one-size-fits-all kind of approach that works for for all jurisdictions. I think, you know, lots of different countries around the world are, are at very different stages of their evolution. But, um, you know, my hope above all is that, you, you know, we'll see more and more policymakers and regulators thinking about, you know, what are what are the ways that we can work with the technology to to get to some really meaningful responses in this space rather than just trying to, to do what's been done before all the time. I guess I guess one thing that I, I'm sorry, I just want to add um so so I was wondering like so would uh you know sovereign identity, digital the this digital identity where it's supported all across in every single jurisdiction. Knowing who that person is and who's transacting, do you think that would solve a lot of issues to connect everything? Yes or no? If I might chime in, there's a, an interesting piece that plays into this is IOSCO went through consultation then issued its final paper on uh, rate, how to regulate DeFi, right? And this follows on from an earlier paper that they had done. One of the topics that came up is one of the possible solutions is a digital identity, right? Mm. In terms of how that can be uh, leveraged. So I think it's definitely one that I'm hearing being discussed uh, in terms of how to help streamline that. Yeah, I guess the, yeah, the reason I, I, I was, yeah, I was thinking about that because if you think about the current market, uh, that has been um, uh, the early adopters. So you can argue they're like like less than one percent of, of all the people that would be in the space uh, dealing with digital assets. The rest of the world maybe don't even care about being anonymous. I mean, that's reality. That's how they've been operating for so many years. So if everyone kind of moved in, say, okay, here's you know, I'll, I'll onboard to this digital identity platform that is not maybe an eye scan, <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, then maybe that would be you know, uh, kind of help to you know, lock down all these email uh, issues, right, of, um, you know, who's who and who's uh, behind all these transactions. But Priscilla, I'll let you continue uh, on your your perspectives. Um, yeah, so I was, I was going to say that uh, it's, you have some of these frameworks in place, you know, coming from these global bodies. At the same time, um, I think the role of consultation and engagement is really, really important. And I think that engagement should go across 
Um, so regulator to regulator. And I think some regulator regulators are very mindful of this in terms of when one, if we take stable coins where one stable coin paper has come out, then is another one being referenced. Um, so not every jurisdiction is like that, but I think that that's helpful in terms of driving consistency when you're dealing with a product that is international and global in its very design in nature. Engagement with users is also uh, quite important um, because it's one thing to sit in kind of an ivory tower and create regulation, but also having, an, I have a great respect for regulators who are also actively engaging um, with the industry to understand, well, we might say, for example, that we, we mean um, you know, the same, uh, same activity, same risk, same regulation, but having a conversation to see if something that's proposed with that intention leads to that outcome, or if it creates these unnecessary inefficiencies or additional burdens that ignore um, the efficiency gains that could be brought and delivered by the technology. I think that stable coins are going to be a really fascinating one to watch just because, again, they are pegs. Um, having lived in Argentina, uh, although not during that crisis, um, you know, just you have that in your mind of how is this really going to work? And I think there are some areas where regulation can be harmonized. There are others where it's going to be really challenging, also based off of the purpose and use cases for digital assets in a given jurisdiction. And if we take stable coins as an example, yeah, it's it's fine for you know, to be using it for a U USDC, USDT are very um, widely used um, and, and traded. But then you know, there was news that came out today um, about Nigeria banning um, access to major uh, crypto uh, exchanges in the country, basically because of a need to stabilize the local currency. So my question is, what happens when you have a stable coin that that can be used as a means of payment uh, in the same jurisdiction as a currency that has inherently high inflation? How is that going to impact the economy? And a regulator in that kind of scenario might have to craft a very different set of rules than a regulator coming from a very stable um, jurisdiction as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I have to say that's one thing that I really saw worked for Hong Kong before it came up with its framework around, you know, for, you know, the, the different, uh, how to, how these are regulated or basically tokens, they did work with the people in the industry to understand, okay, feedback to us. They had a, a paper uh, that kind of was sent out and then they fed back. And I think it was a really great way to work in collaboration to finalize and, and come up with a framework that made sense for the, its, its own jurisdiction. So I guess um, I'll ask uh, the last question here for both of you before we uh, end this AMA. Um, I wanted to ask, guess if you're looking ahead, what do you what are your predictions for? I guess the next big challenge in balancing decentralization and regulation in a in, I guess in the space. Uh, does another FTX need to happen, or can we can it be more proactive? I so uh, I, I guess specific. Um... Issues of reconciliation. I, I do think the issue around digital identity, um, sort of balancing those notions of identity, identity verification, privacy, um, data protection in this the big one. I, I think it goes back to you know, what we were saying at the beginning, one of the first points I think Priscilla made around you know that notion that you know absolute anonymity just isn't acceptable from a regulatory perspective, and and we are going to have to find a way to I think bridge that gap in this space to get it enable to getting there is going to be take some time and there's going to be a real process. I mean, um, obviously to have kind of a, a sort of portable framework across jurisdictions would require a lot of, of multilateral work to get jurisdictions on the same plane in terms of how that should all be governed. Um, uh, you know, technological challenges, a lot of which are being worked on um, that, that uh, are, are needed to make that happen. Um, but I think, uh, I, I think the issue... if I just uh, give some yes. final, yes. final thoughts then as, yeah. as well, I'd say, you know, I, I think the, yeah, at the end of the day, regulators want to hold people accountable, right? Right. If something goes wrong. So I don't think it's about waiting to have the next FTX happen, but it's about a regulator having the assurance of, okay, if, or when something goes, goes wrong, whether it's a DEX, whether it's a DAP, whether it's a, a C5, whatever, I want to be able to identify who's responsible 
hold them accountable and protect the people in my jurisdiction. So that's always going to be one of the key drivers. I think just, again, because stable coins are quite hot right now because of the regulation, the consultation paper and everything in, in Hong Kong, I, I think there are also some very practical issues uh, to be worked through. And another one that I'm keen to see is um, you have some potential for extraterritoriality to come in off the back of some of the stablecoin regulation and to a greater extent than we than we've actually seen in TradFi, right? When we think think of extraterritoriality, we think of the US, USD clearing, um, and uh OFAC sanctions compliance, right? That's the big one. But if you read some of these consultations um and some of the new regulations coming in, what you find is that you have regulators who have said, um, you know, if there's going to be a stable coin that is issued somewhere in the world, but uses my um, currency, then you have to be regulated by me. And I think that's going to be really interesting to see does, how can that work in DeFi, right? How can, uh, and are we going to, and what's going to happen? as a result of that, right? Will it provide for a safer system, which I think hopefully is is the goal, um, or what's the potential for it to spiral in a different direction? So a lot of these are going to be you know, almost working through and seeing what happens, what works, what doesn't work. And I hope also that regulation can be iterative. I um, mean, obviously you want it to be stable to a certain extent, but also if there's a change in the technology, if there's a change in how users are adopting um, virtual assets, then that regulation will change to reflect that as well. Thank you guys very much for your answers. Again, I'm truly impressed by our space today. I feel like, you know, the regulation topic might be uh, one of the most important now in this space because yeah for the most part people are talking you know different coins blockchains bull runs uh things like this and uh, obviously it excites people a lot because uh, we all you know want to make it one day as we say it in crypto but still the question of regulations and this regulatory market is uh, extremely important now so thank you very much for your time thank you very much for your thoughts and for your answers and uh, for the final touches maybe there is anything you want to add at this moment thank you so much for having us and thanks for everyone who listened in and hopefully to see many of you at the summit yes, definitely hope i see you guys on summit and Hong Kong.